All right. Hey, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, nice day. Did you all have a good day today? All right, me too. All right. All right, then. Well, back in Nehemiah, that's a... Uh, mm. He's my favorite guy right now. <laughs> and my hero. Um, I was thinking about this today. Nehemiah going through this Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem. Those are the three bad guys that we've been dealing with in Nehemiah. For two months, these men have done everything they could do to stop Nehemiah and the work God sent him to do. They started in chapter 2, verse 19, with their threats. And Nehemiah told them, the God of heaven... He will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Man, he said a mouthful, didn't he? Which side of this would you want to be on? You've got those three bad guys. They look like they got it all together. They got the power, the money behind them, the government, some of the government. But here's Nehemiah said, no. There are these evil men that seem to have it all, have all the power, money, influence, notoriety, and powerful be people behind them, but they don't have the God of heaven on their side. That's the difference. And if God be for us, who can be against us? These evil men have been unsuccessful in their attempts to stop Nehemiah and his work, even though there were many in Judah sworn unto them. So there were traitors within the walls, and there were traitors without the walls. You can expect that, I guess. But the work continued and moved forward. Nehemiah never looked back. He has always moved forward. And I just learned this yesterday, because when you look back, you lose a step. When you look back, you lose a step. And in this race, every step counts. Remember the Lord. He is above all. That was just my thoughts on this. And thank you, Bill, for doing the time of studying and all this. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for what you're putting in each of us as we come and hear your word being expounded upon and explained to us. And uh, it's amazing. God, it's just really amazing how this fits our time. And I pray that we're learning how to respond, how to keep moving forward, how not to look back and realize that there are, will be traitors within the walls and without the walls and to expect that and to keep moving forward. Don't let it stop us. Don't let it get us confused or dismayed or cast down or in fear. But Lord, to have courage because we are looking to the God of heaven. And Lord, we thank you that you are on our side and that when we're with you, that nothing can stand against us. God, we thank you so much for Bill and the time that he takes to study, to present that to us. And God, may it have a, a great effect in our lives, especially in, these, in the age that we're in and the coming time. Help us to pass this on to our children so that they may have courage also, God. And we thank you so much and ask you to be with Bill Give him strength. Give his voice strength. Uh, open our hearts and our minds so we can receive all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Rusty, for preparing us to go back into Nehemiah. It's, uh, it's like each week. When I go on a Wednesday to study, I have to kind of review because there's so much we have to think about every week, and we kind of have a tendency to forget what we've learned. I do. And things get out of balance. And if they're not in their rightful place, then life gets out of balance. So worship, we've got to keep that number one, our worship of God. Then everything else comes behind that, our work, our rest, whatever. But it, it's hardest to keep that number one thing the number one thing. That's what's going to be attacked. So 
They're coming back from their 70-year captivity. I think we started in the book of Daniel. Did, did we do all of Daniel? Yeah. And so we wanted to follow the, the captives when they came back from the 70 years. And then we'll probably move from Nehemiah into Esther um, to follow them a little bit more, those who did not come back after this. And uh, you had three groups that came back, th three groups that left under uh, Babylon, uh, the, the uh, wars. Um, Billy Morgan is walking around in the parking lot. I don't know why. So uh, I just saw his face. Don, would you let Billy Morgan in? Thank you. Um, and then spank him for me? I'm just joking. So anyway, you had the kingly line, Zerubbabel, come back first with the 42,360 under Cyrus. And then, um, then you had Ezra. He was the high priest line. He came back and did his function there to restore the worship and so forth. Um, then you had Nehemiah, and I don't know what category to put him in. I've never seen a man like this that can do so many things and just put everything in order and go right to the point of the problem and be bold and name the problem and then get the solution. Uh, boy, if we had men like that in leadership all over, uh, it would be this country would be run totally different than uh, it's being run right now. So they set the altar up, and then that was the first step. Uh, their city and all the walls and everything had been destroyed. And so they're done with idolatry, at least for a time. And remember when we first started that God told Jeremiah before they were ever exiled, what he was going to do. And he took him down to the potter's house to show Jeremiah what he was going to do to Israel. Remember that? And he said, look at the potter. He has a vessel in his hand. Hey, Billy, come on in. He had a vessel in his hand that was marred, Jeremiah chapter 18. And he said the, the potter took the vessel and he made it again another vessel as it pleased him. And he said, cannot I do with Israel as this potter did with this vessel? So then that's what we see the purpose of the 70 year captivity was. God is remaking them into a vessel that pleases him as he's doing us. And his methods can seem very severe, right? I mean, think of what it took to get that nation who had gone into idolatry back to a state of worshiping God. Everything they went through was very severe, and what they wound up is a holy remnant. And that's usually the case with Israel, is that that's what they always had, a holy remnant, and then you had the rest. So um, God is in the business of remaking a vessel that pleases him, and we want to commit ourselves to him. This is a process that goes on all of our lives, at every stage of life, and then we want to be able to pray, God, whatever it takes in our lives or our children's lives to bring them around to where they're remade into your image and are concerned about your purposes, you know, and that's a very difficult thing to pray sometimes. Some believe that God, oh, if I, if I tell God to make me into a saint and do whatever it takes to make me into a servant of God, um, I don't know if I can pray that prayer. A friend of mine in Selma, an older man, said he prayed that God would make him into a person like the Apostle Paul. And then he said all hell broke loose in his life and this went wrong and that went wrong. And he said he reneged on his prayer. He was honest about it. But, you know, there is always grace with God no matter what. And we will never repent of the good work that God does in us. And even though Hebrews says for the moment, no chastening seems joyous, but grievous. 
but afterward it brings the peaceable fruit of righteousness in those that are exercised therein. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for whatever it is in our life that's going on to remake us, and we will not repent of whatever God uses to accomplish that purpose. Amen. Okay. Uh, remember that life always is about surrendering up to God. We will go through a thousand surrenders in our life. You will have times you have to surrender your children to God when they get grown and on their own, and you can no longer hold them and take care of them and this sort of thing, and they're away from you, and they're in a place that's dangerous or whatever. You have to give them up to God. Uh, you may have to surrender physical disability up to God and give it to him. Um, old age. Um, I used this example before that I was going down my driveway and there's a new neighborhood there and there was a man squatting in his yard and he couldn't move and I went over there to talk to him because he's the grandson of one of the big three generals of World War II, I won't name his name. And, um, and he was also a retired military. And I went over there and I said, are you okay? And he said, well, I've got this heart condition and you know, I just have to wait until I can get up and go back into the house. And he was probably mid fifties. And uh, he says to me, but, but God knows, doesn't he? But God knows. And uh, don't you have to say that? You have to say that to yourself. God knows, he cares, he's able. Um, you know, uh, I had a guy a couple of days ago, a couple of days ago call me and he said, listen, uh, I know this guy that um, is a Christian and he's got full power. Do you want me to arrange a meeting and you and him pray over that condition you have in your jaw? And I said, uh, I appreciate your concern, but uh, when God is ready, all he has to do is say the word, you know. Um, and I'm happy your fellow has full power. <laughs> but, you know, uh, God knows, he cares, and if he wants to do something about it, he is certainly able to. So we commit ourselves to God, and in Jesus, his last moment on the cross, he said, Lord, into, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You know, I looked up that today, and that was a direct quote out of Psalm 31, verse 5. He's quoting David, his ancestral father, so to speak, you know, and he's called the son of David, and he's quoting Psalm 31. It's a, it's a psalm uh, of going through very difficult times when David wrote this. And it's a song of him pleading with God for help, which you find in the Psalms goes on quite a bit. And to have these magnificent Psalms that they could sing that would bring them such great strength. And so David is the first one to appoint singers that would be in the house of God, singers that would lead the armies into battle, you know. And uh, I remember reading about one war, and I can't remember which one it was, but the loser of the war said, if we had had their music, we would have won. They had the right music when they went into battle that transferred their faith onto God. So we'll talk about that more in just a little while. So here we're back, the altars rebuilt, the temples rebuilt, Ezra the high priest is sent by Artaxerxes, a Persian king. People, you know, they say, I don't like Donald Trump. Well, you know, the Jews have a coin minted with Cyrus on one side and Donald Trump on the other. They see Donald Trump as the Old Testament King Cyrus who freed the Jews to go back home. He used a pagan king and they equate Donald Trump with Cyrus. So when Ezra arrived back and, and uh, to work on the house of God, he found that many of the men had married foreign wives, which was unlawful for a Jew to do. Not only had they married foreign wives, these foreign wives had led them into rank idolatry. 
And so they had gone back to the, the reasons why God destroyed them in the first place. And so what did Ezra do? He pulled all of his hair out. He pulled his beard out. He sat there weeping, not eating. And when people went by and saw this godly man, man uh, in such repentance, it stirred them up in their hearts that they were wrong in what they were doing. And so one by one, they said, hey, we'll take us a little time, but we will put away our strange wives. We will repent, every single one of us. And they performed what God told them to do in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And so once again, spiritual worship was restored from the top man. And the, the rulers were guilty of this down to the lowest. And it saved the nation from being destroyed forever. Well, 14 years later, after Ezra, God sends Nehemiah. He's there. I think he's in Shushan, the palace. It's the Persian uh, kingdom. And his brother comes back from Jerusalem, and he says, Hey, brother, what's it like over in Jerusalem? Give me the news. What's the word on the street? He said, Brother Nehemiah, let me tell you, the people are in such straits they have not rebuilt the city. The walls are still torn down. The gates are not there. The people are in great distress. So Nehemiah is a man of action. He's a man of doing. And he says to his king as he bears his wine to him, give me permission. Send me over to help my people the place where my fathers are buried. And the king, Artaxerxes, gives him that permission. And so he and others, the third wave, come back to rebuild the wall and to set the gates. They need a place of safety because they're in the midst of a hostile territory. And there's the army of the Samaritans, and there's the three men that Rusty mentioned just a while ago. And so he comes back, he looks around quietly, he sees what is the first matter of business. You know, sometimes that's difficult to put first things first and decide what's the first thing to do. This guy had a talent for this. I mean, he had a gift for doing this. And he wasn't a talker, he was a doer. And so he knew that God had put in his heart to rebuild the, the walls and set up the gates. And that's what he told the elders. He told them, look, this is what God has put in my heart to do. And they rose up and said, then let's do it. We've got a plan now. We know that's what we need to be doing. And so he was, had access to the king's forest and the inhabitants had to supply all their needs according to the king's order. So these three evil men were humiliated because the order from Artaxerxes they had to pay tribute to this rebuilding of the holy city, the walls, the gates. And so um, that's what they did. And they built, they had a trial in one hand, and they had a sword in the other. You say, well, where was their faith? Why did they walk around with a sword in the hand? Because that's how we do. We believe God, but we're on guard. We're on guard, right? And... That's why we have borders. That's why we have walls. And God commanded the walls and the gates to go up. I remember one time I was doing some work, and um, it was a lady who was raised in Peru, and she married an American. And um, she wanted me to go replace some windows in a trailer park. Someone had gotten angry and knocked the windows out of one of the trailers. And um, I knew about the trailer park, and I had seen it before. And if you ever need some crack, there's your place. Um, it was that kind of trailer park. So I just put my 38 Smith & Wesson in a convenient place and got my tools together. And she said, where is your faith? And I said, my faith in God, but my 38's with me here because obviously you must have more faith than I do. Um, I believe in being prepared. And if that's wrong, then I'll just have to say, hey, God, you told them to put a sword in their hand, didn't you, when they rebuilt? So, you know, there's a time to 
have a sword? And Jesus said, there's a time to put up the sword. He said both those things, right? All right. So anyway, they, when they came there and they began to work and build the walls and the gates, the people were still very poor in the outlying areas, the Jews and so forth, and the city was in a rubble. So there weren't many inhabitants inside the city. A famine came upon the land. I have no idea what that noise was. A famine came upon the land, and so they began to mortgage their houses, their lands, um, their children, you name it, and they, became, they were very desperate and almost destroyed them. They had nothing stored up. And so Nehemiah solved the problem because there were certain Jews there that had money and they had lent money to their fellow Jews at a high interest rate called usury. And so this was against the law of God for a Jew to charge usury to a poor fellow Jew. It was against the Mosaic law. Nehemiah quoted it to them. He got a group together to witness against them and thank God they repented because if they had not repented, the work would not have gone on, the rebuilding of this godly community. And so these nobles gave them back their money, their lands, their houses, and so forth, and the work went on, and the wall was built, this huge wall that enclosed 200 acres of land was built in 52 days. That's an amazing task considering everywhere they walked, they had to walk over rubble to go back and forth to the wall. It was nothing but concrete, rubble, stone, whatever. Very difficult job. So that's where we were. Remember that Sam Ballot and Tobiah sought several different ways to stop the work. First, they tried to convince Nehemiah to come out of the temple and let's have a meeting together and talk about things and so forth when their attempt was to assassinate him because they knew he was the key figure. And so they tried five times to get him to come out. Most people will cave in under pressure, right? And we're easily persuaded by pressure. If people press on us in a certain direction, we're tempted to go whatever way they're pressing us, right? All right, so he stood up to them. He didn't leave the city. And anyway, uh, then they tried to, as you know, hire false prophets to say, and, and no, first they accused Nehemiah that what he wanted to do was to make himself a king. And that way that would be a king against Artaxerxes, a rebellious king, which was a lie. He wasn't trying to do that and commit insurrection. So that went on. Then he hired false prophets try to convince Nehemiah, hey, go hide in the temple. He wouldn't do it because that would be uh, evidence that perhaps he was doing something that was uh, wrong. And so he just kept praying and doing the work, and that's what we're to be doing. We're to be praying. uh, We're to be watching. uh, We're to be asking for wisdom. We're to be asking for strength. And keep on going. And we're not just to be concerned about our own life. We're to be watching about the lives of others. Is God leading us in in any way to look at others and their plight in life? Can we look outside the box a little bit? Because we can get so wrapped up in our own lives and our own concerns that we fail to look on the things of others, right? So it says, look not every man on his own things, but also on what? The things of others. So that's, we need to keep that in mind. Now, our work is never through in this life. It will not be through as long as we live. Even when my mother had a stroke and could do nothing, she prayed, prayed, prayed. When we go over there, she was reciting the name of her kids out loud continually. And my name was Billy Dawn. (laughs) <laughs> and that was Dawn's name. Uh, that sh- was her connection there she could pray about. And I don't know about the other kids. 
You know, she probably didn't pray for them. I'm joking. Um, we needed it more. So we have a responsibility to see to it that we need to continue to strengthen our families, our communities, in any way that we're able to. Some of our job is to strengthen each other in the faith. I would say that's probably all of our jobs. Um, and there's other people that have physical needs to see about. There's financial needs. Um, so we're never retired from God's will. Amen? We're never retired from God's will. There is, God puts a charge on us for us to complete our course. So, hey, you may be fortunate to retire from a job, and I, I hope you are, but you're never retired from doing the will of God. So Nehemiah had done so much. Now he's going to continue to spread out a plan for the city, a city plan. This guy is amazing. The city was in ruins. The wall was new. The gates were set up. But the first order of business before they started rebuilding the inner cities, they had to um, encourage the public worship of God. And that's in Nehemiah chapter 7, where we are. Verse 1, look at the first order of business, okay? Now it came to pass when the wall was built and I had set up the doors and the porters, the singers, and the Levites were appointed. Well, of course, I have to look up everything all the time because of dementia, I guess. But I have to look up every word and go, what is this, what is this, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so he sets up the porters, the singers, and the Levites. He's first establishing our worship. That that is the first thing that we do. Before he gets any military guys or anything else, he establishes our reverence for Almighty God, and he uses the singers to bring that about. The fear of God. Men who fear God, and so... Porters are gatekeepers, doorkeepers, those who watch the entrance of doors. You didn't just wander in and out of Jerusalem. Oh, I think this is an open city with no borders. So we'll just wander in and out and we'll go into the buildings and the houses and all. No, you will not. David had 4,000 porters set up before the temple was built to get them ready. He established a lot of things before Solomon built the temple and he died. He was the first one to set up the singers, the porters, and the nethanim. And so um, he drew these singers from the priestly line of the Levites. You know, you don't want to hire ACDC. I mean, let's face it. You know, you get a lot of guys and they go into battle, you know, somewhere in foreign country in the military and you watch these movies and they've got rock and roll music and they're on these tanks going into battle. Mm -hmm. No, you want godly music set up to go into. And so he draws them from the Levites and uh, David was the first one to establish the holy choir in Israel to sing praises to God. And you can read that sometime if you want to in 1 Chronicles 15, verse 16. And then when they would go into battle, who went first? The singers, the choir. They went out before the army and they praised the beauty of holiness. They sang praises to God for he is holy and his mercy endures forever. And you know, uh, that must have been an awesome thing. But our worship must go ahead of everything else. That is the first thing, is our worship, fearing Almighty God for His mercy, the beauty of holiness, His character. Um, I remember last year, about this time of year, July 4th was coming up, and I want to make it down to the bluff for the Ball and Pops concert. 
And um, I'd also promised a fellow that lives nearby, that normally, normally is here on Wednesday night, that I would come by because he was having his small groups meeting at his house on the bluff. So, you know, as usual, trying to cover two bases at once. So I can hear the music from this fellow's house. And the ball and pops for the first time, I've, I've been going to almost every one on the bluff for July 4th. They actually played a hymn that comes out of Psalm 90, um, O God, our help in ages past. And I'm going, I cannot believe they're playing that. You know, what strength this is going to bring to our city when people are hearing these publicly played hymns. It's one thing to do it in private, but when you bring a city together and you lead them in a hymn like that, God our refuge, our help in ages past, and, uh, and all the lyrics that go with that, um, I'm going to tell you, I felt so good about that. And the people, instead of playing this nonsense music sometime, that uh, I don't want to be negative, but um, they could be playing some really good stuff, you know. And uh, anyway, next, Nehemiah sets up two governors over the city. That's in verse 2. Their qualifications were, you'll see, that I, may, that I gave my brother Hanani, so he's the one that brought him news in the first place, and Hanani, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, qualifications, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. Well, there it is right there. That's the kind of man you want. That's the kind of man you can trust. A man who fears the awesome holiness of God and that affects his life to where he keeps that in mind and seeks to obey the laws of God. You don't have to worry about that man. That's the kind of man that you want. And so to have an awesome respect and reverence that issues in obedience to God. He was one in 10,000 men. Now, he directs them how to open and close the city. Now, we need somebody on the southern border that knows how to open and close the border, don't we? God doesn't believe in open cities and open borders. That's why he directed him to build a wall and put the gates up. He knew that the enemy would get in. You know, yeah, we can talk about our faith, but we also have to prepare. And so look at how he said to open up the city. Verse 3, and I said unto them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened up until the sun be hot. In other words, don't just go out in the morning and fling the gates open when it's kind of dark. No telling who's lurking out there waiting to get in. Let the sun come up and light everything up before you open any gate. Let's see what we're dealing with today. Could be that there's 10,000 Samaritans out there waiting to rush the gate. No telling. And so that's what they did. And so they, uh, and while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them. Who really is saying all this? This is God saying all of this. He's the one giving instructions. Gates, bars, protection, fortifications. And appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone in his watch, everyone to be over against his house. And so there it is. Jerusalem was not just a city that said, hey, anybody that wants to, come on in. That sounds real uh, liberal and um, loving, but you know what? It's an invitation for evil to come in. And uh, we have to set up walls and gates in our hearts also. And that's what we're doing. We want to do both. We want to have a protected community. I mean, I know a fellow that he had a bunch of rental houses. And you know, if you're a person that has rental places, sometimes you can't hardly get them out. 
and they know how to work the system. So what he would do in the night, he would just go take the doors off of their homes. It worked. You know, you don't want to be there laying there night after night with no doors on your house. You know why? Somebody might get in in the middle of the night. So he said it worked for him. Um, so, you know, this idea of being open and compassionate and saying that America is the international city and everyone has a right to be here, no, they do not. They need to be vetted. We need to know who's getting into our country. And this idea that it's so open, that, hey, our libraries now are just open and a drag queen can come in and talk to our kids, no. And can get into our schools, no. Or that LGBT is acceptable and celebrated in our town and our city council has to allow that to happen because the federal government says so, no, no, no. We have got to start saying no and standing up to things and not have this liberal spirit that we're so um, tolerant. You know, wouldn't it be something if the city council and mayor of our city were such God-fearing men and women that they cited the scripture and would not allow the LGBT or the drag queens or that movement to come into our cities and our elementary schools, which is going on now. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have such leaders in our community to, that have the power to stop this and to enforce this? But we're seeing the breakdown of law and order in America. And we see the houses of our Supreme Court justices and they're being tormented and they have to put a fence up around the Supreme Court. No, that's all wrong. That is not godly. So anyway, the public safety also depends upon everyone's particular to guard himself or herself and their family against sin and not let evil get in to our family. Now we have learned that the hard way and we're learning that the hard way. Uh, I have a certain example in mind. A young boy, when he got to around 12 or 13, insisted that he be granted a cell phone. And I happen to know this story very well. His mother said, absolutely yes. His father said, absolutely no. Guess who won? Mama wins. Why? Because if she don't win, she goes ballistic. The cell phone comes in. Not much longer, they begin to see strange cars in the neighborhood. They live in a nice neighborhood. They begin to see strange men. They begin to start missing money in their home. They begin to see a change in their child's behavior. They begin to see transactions going on. Cars from other cities winding up right here around their house. Men that look like thugs coming around. All because the door was opened up through a cell phone and this child now had access to whomever and whatever because a liberal, compassionate mother insisted that he have that. And they have reaped the whirlwind. You don't think that access to the internet doesn't open you up to the world of evil. It does. And yet, us parents, aren't we so compassionate? And aren't the schools so great to make sure that all the children have internet access at such a young age? Anyway, the last thing we're gonna talk about here is that the city was in shambles and it needed to be populated. The city needed more people, but he was very particular who he was gonna fill the city with. You just don't wanna fill the holy city with a bunch of dirt bags, right? You want to fill them with godly people. And so he looks at the register of people who came back in the first wave under Ezra 
And remember, we saw that in Ezra, I think it was in chapter 2. And it had the names of all the people that came back. And he goes through that register there and sees all the people that were the original families that came back. And then he takes a poll of all the people that are there now and he compares them back and forth. And so um, he wanted to see who was qualified to serve as a priest or a porter or a singer because they had to be of the godly line of the Levites. And so he goes through those offices and those roles and let's skip over uh, and go all the way down to verse 63 and look at this problem that rises up. And of the priests, the children of what is that? Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzilla, which took one of the daughters of Barzilla, the Gileadite. Now, he was a good guy, remember? Uh, to wife and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. He, they couldn't find this family in the genealogy. And so they didn't really know if they could were qualified to eat of the temple meat, the sacred uh, offerings that the people offered and that the priests were allowed to eat of. So it was not a clear picture. Now some would have waffled on and said, hey, you know, let's go ahead and let them come in and be a part of the offerings and this, no, no. Um, verse 65, and the Tershatha, Okay, I had to look that up. Does anybody know what the Tershatha is? It's a ruler. That's right. It's a Persian governor. Very good, Ron. It's a Persian governor. Who was the Persian governor? Anybody know? It's Nehemiah. Nehemiah was appointed by the king to be the governor. And if you want to see that, look at chapter 8, verse 9. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha. All right, so we're on solid ground. Now let's go back to verse 65 in chapter 7. And the Tershatha, that's Nehemiah, said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with the Urim and Thummim. Now, you know, you have, this is the first time you hear, I think this might have been mentioned back in Ezra, the Urim and the Thummim, but we don't really know what happened to that holy vestment that the high priest wore. Remember he had an ephod, a holy vestment that he put on and it had 12 stones on it, each of them representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel where he went into the temple and prayed. He made intercession for every tribe in Israel. And also there were the stones set there, one the Urim and the Thummim. And to put it in a simplistic form that I need, it was to get an answer from God. God sometimes gave answers directly. Sometimes it was in visions. Sometimes it was in dreams. But commonly, it was through the stones of Urim and Thummim. One of them meant basically yes, and the other one, when it lit up, went basically no. And so if a person had a question about a particular thing, they could ask God for an answer. That would mean yes. No. And they got their orders from God. So they're waiting on that before they allowed the descendants or Barzilla to become part of the priesthood uh, group. So they didn't budge on that issue. And so um, he goes on to list um, certain people who were going to be put into the city. He didn't want to have so many people that it was a drag on the local farming community. He wanted, see, this city is sort of like the executive branch. This is where all of the holy activity was going to go on, and the communities then would come into the city on certain holy days, certain feast days, and so this was like the executive branch. The priests, the porters, the singers, all of those kind of people were here, and it was enough to defend the city but it wasn't so many that it drugged down the community, the farming community around them and was a burden on them. 
So he's making this balance out just right. And so um, let's go down, he says, uh, verse 70, and some of the chief of the fathers gave unto the work. Remember what the work is going on right now? What's the work going on? No, it's not the wall and the gates. It's the building of the houses inside the city and getting people to populate the city. The wall and the gates are done. And so, verse 70, some of the chief of the fathers gave unto the work. The Tershatha, who is that? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. All right. Gave to the treasure a thousand drams of gold, 50 basins, 530 priest garments. And some of the chief of the fathers gave to the treasure of the work 20,000 drams of gold, 2,200 pounds of silver. Can you imagine these people giving this? I mean, your heart's got to be in it. You know what I mean? He is playing. He's committing everything. It's like, Lord, here's everything I've got. I'm pushing it over for your work to be done right here. And, of course, being the governor, he's setting the example. So um, it seems to be, and we're coming to a very big chapter next week, very big chapter next week, um, that because of the work of these men and the organization of all of this, it brought about a godly community. And this is uh, very difficult to bring about. This takes the effort of God's people. It takes the repentance of people in their hearts to turn to God. And to pull this off is indeed a miracle. Verse 73, so the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, some of the people, the Nethanims, and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Boy, to me, there is a big sigh of relief implied in this, that this has been accomplished. A great thing has been accomplished. Now we're going to see something very interesting. Remember, in the seventh month, there are three major feast days, trumpets, atonements, tabernacles. Trumpets is when God calls all the people to come together. And now they've got a temple here. They no longer have the tabernacle of meeting, the portable thing they carried around. This is the second temple. And so when they assemble, all of them will come into the city for the Feast of Trumpets. And we're going to see something amazing happen on this particular feast day because they're going to come to an understanding of holiness and in return an understanding of sin. And it's going to be the greatest and the most awful day and we're going to see the surprising reaction of God when these people come to full understanding. That's what we're going to see next week. All right. That's where we'll end tonight. Um, how much good these three men did to influence other men to seek God. How it grew into a community, a holy city. Every man doing his part. And let us do the same thing. Every single one of us has a circle of influence. And we all have a part that's needed that benefits the whole. Let's pray. Lord, uh, sometimes what we do seems so small. But if we live before you as men and women who fear God, together we can influence others and be salt and light. We know at the same time that we're doing this, we still need much work done in us to be remade into your image, just as they did. But you're leading us along as you did them. Certain times we need to repent as they did or we will stagnate and we won't go forward. We depend 
on your help, no matter what that looks like, that we know that you have the power to remake us again into a vessel that is pleasing to you. We ask you tonight for a greater understanding of holiness and the need to praise and worship you ahead of work and warfare. Lord, you tell us to rejoice evermore in all things. We're learning that. We know there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all, that is, acting in all of our lives. And not only that, he is in all of us who have trusted you as Savior. Help us, Lord, to learn to fear you greatly as these men did and to continue to seek to do your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.